This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silence them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is episode 93, Case Update Special number 6. In this episode, I'll provide updates on multiple cases I've covered in past episodes. The stories I'll be updating today include those of Serenity Sutley, Josias Marquez, and Keaton Boggs whose stories I told in episodes 21, 24, and 30. Before I jump into the updates, I'd like to thank my newest patrons, Margaret H. from Slidell, Louisiana, Cindy M. from London, England, and Sarah M. and Emma B. from Castle Rock. Thank you all so much for your support. By making a pledge to suffer the little children, you're helping me reach my goal of permanently devoting myself full-time to the podcast and the blog, so I appreciate my patrons more than I could ever tell you. To make a pledge, you can visit patreon.com slash stlcpod. Thank you all again. I'm going to try to release one more update episode before the end of the year, and that should bring us up to speed on all of the cases I've covered on the podcast that need updating. Like I've said before, I can't just cover a case once and forget about it. It's essential to me that I see each case through, and even after each child gets justice, the most important part of this for me is ensuring the child is never forgotten. The first case I'll update today is that of one-year-old Serenity Sutley, whose story I originally told in episode 21 and recently updated in episode 90, case update special number 5. Because I covered it just a few weeks ago, I won't go into detail about Serenity's story again, but here's a brief recap. Serenity's mother, 22-year-old Kelsey Blankenship, found Serenity dead in her crib in their apartment in Conneaut, Ohio, on October 7, 2017. Kelsey's 37-year-old boyfriend, Joshua Gerdo, was questioned and released. He was soon charged with multiple crimes relating to Serenity's rape and murder, at which point he fled, leading police on a three-week manhunt that ended when he was captured in a gas station parking lot in Pennsylvania. A year later, Kelsey was also charged with murder and other charges in connection with her daughter's death. In 2020, Joshua was charged in a previously cold rape and burglary case from 2004. Earlier this year, Kelsey accepted a plea agreement and was sentenced to six years in prison with credit for 887 days served. Joshua continues to await trial, both for Serenity's rape and murder and the 2004 rape and burglary case. Today's update concerns his rape and burglary trial, which was scheduled to begin on Friday, December 3, 2021. However, the trial was canceled after documents were filed with the Ohio Supreme Court attempting to disqualify Judge Marianne Cezanne who has been the judicial officer overseeing both of Joshua's cases since his arrest in 2017. According to the Ashtabula Star Beacon, on November 29th, judgment entries were filed from the Ohio Supreme Court, stating that the clerk of the Supreme Court had accepted an affidavit to disqualify Judge Cezanne from both the aggravated burglary and rape case and Serenity's murder case. Joshua has pleaded not guilty in both cases. The judgment entry gives Judge Cezanne three weeks to file a response to the affidavit, which means she must respond by Christmas Eve. After the judge's response is filed, Ohio Supreme Court Chief Justice Maureen O'Connor will review the case and issue a written ruling. Until that ruling is released, Judge Cezanne is barred from any authority to preside over Joshua's case. It is unknown who or which entity filed the affidavit because they requested all filings in the matter be sealed. The documents filed with the Ohio Supreme Court will therefore remain sealed unless they are court-ordered to be released. 
This feels to me like retaliation for Judge Cezanne recently rejecting the prosecution's attempt at giving Joshua a ridiculously sweet plea agreement that would have seen him out of prison in 18 years instead of spending the rest of his pathetic life rotting behind bars where he allegedly belongs. I'm positively gagging to find out who filed the affidavit and what their reasoning was, although we may never know. All I know for sure is that I'm crossing every appendage possible that Judge Cezanne is allowed to remain on the case, that it's not delayed any further, that Joshua Gerdo never takes another breath as a free man, and that true justice is obtained for precious baby Serenity, the tiny, blonde-haired, blue-eyed princess who celebrated only one birthday during her short life. If you're anything like me, the next update I'll give today will piss you off at least as much as the last one did. As soon as this update hit my inbox this week, I immediately felt sick, and my apologies to my 17-year-old for the tirade I went on in the car. Fortunately for both of us, he agrees that this sentence is absolute and utter bullshit. Also in episode 90, I provided an update on the case of 5-year-old Josias Marquez of Howard, Wisconsin, whose story I told in episode 24. Josias, who suffered from meningitis as a newborn, was left with severe epilepsy and cerebral palsy, blind, and unable to walk, crawl, feed himself, or speak. As such, he was classified as high needs and required round-the-clock care. On March 31, 2020, Josias's partially mummified remains were found in a duffel bag in the trunk of his mother's vehicle. She received multiple charges, including chronic neglect of a child resulting in death, a Class B felony, hiding the corpse of a child, a Class F felony, neglect of a child under six years of age with a disability, neglect of a child, five counts of obstructing an officer, and forgery uttering with the modifier of party to a crime. Investigators believed she simply stopped feeding Josias sometime after he was last seen in November of 2019, and after he died, hid his remains in her car. Josias' older brother and younger sister were both healthy and well-nourished at the time his body was discovered. Fortunately, they now live with their father's family in California. In October of 2021, Josiah's mother, 26-year-old Sagal Hussein, accepted a plea agreement pleading no contest to two felony charges, child neglect resulting in death and hiding the corpse of a child, as well as three misdemeanors, obstruction, and two counts of child neglect. Her sentencing took place as scheduled on December 7th, which brings us to the update. At Sagal's sentencing hearing, for which the convicted appeared via Zoom, Josias's father, James Marquez, who, along with his mother, flew from California to Wisconsin to attend the sentencing hearing, fought back tears as he told Judge Thomas Walsh about his difficulty explaining to Josias's siblings what happened to their brother. I've got no type of answers. I don't even know what day he died. My kids are going to grow older and ask more questions. She took my son. She took my son. James's mom, Tina, said to the judge, All we're asking is justice for Josias. Seagal herself was permitted to give a statement, saying that she panicked after going into Josias's bedroom and finding his body cold from what she assumed was a seizure. As a parent, watching your child suffer is one of the greatest pains you can feel. This will be something that I'll forever have to live with. With all due respect, I call bullshit. Brown County District Attorney David Lassie also saw through Seagal's pathetic attempt to paint herself as the victim telling the court that her actions both before and after Josias's death belied her claims to be a loving mother. He said she had obviously underfed the helpless little boy, not to mention making a curious decision to stop giving him his prescribed seizure medication, instead giving him CBD because she saw it on the internet. In addition, he gave a detail we hadn't previously heard. Seagal's use of alcohol and drugs had increased over the year prior to her son's death. Then, after Josias died, Her elaborate lie continued, leading police on a wild goose chase. She finally hid her son's body in a garage, covering him with garbage to mask the smell of decomposition. What type of person could engage in such depravity with regard to her own child? At the end of the hearing, Judge Walsh sentenced Seagal to the apparent maximum of 15 years in prison, followed by 10 years of probation for her felony convictions. Her shorter sentences on the misdemeanor charges would be served concurrently. The day after sentencing, Seagal's attorney filed a notice with the court that they would seek post-conviction relief, which could mean she intends to request a shorter sentence. Seagal remains in the Brown County Jail, awaiting transfer to an unspecified Wisconsin state prison. 
I'm just so disgusted by this awful woman's pathetic sentence that I'm honestly too depressed to muster up anger at this point. My heart aches just imagining the hell Josias endured for God knows how many weeks or even months as he slowly starved to death, alone, all the while suffering violent seizures. All I can do is continue to promise that Josias will never be forgotten. In the wake of Seagal's sentencing, I hope James, Tina, Josias' siblings, and everyone else who truly loved the little boy they called Jojo can start to heal. You may remember the story of five-year-old Keaton Boggs, who was the subject of episode 30 of this podcast. Keaton was airlifted to J.W. Ruby Memorial Hospital in Morgantown, West Virginia on March 18, 2020, after his paternal grandmother, Michelle Boggs, and his paternal aunt, Chastity Wodzinski, brought him to a local hospital, unresponsive. He died after two days on life support. Keaton had suffered a head injury causing bleeding in his brain and eyes, as well as bruises on his face, head, collarbone, and neck, and assorted injuries to his ear, inner thigh, and genitals. All of his injuries were in varying degrees of healing, indicating they occurred over multiple incidents. According to a forensic pathologist, Keaton's death was a homicide caused by blunt force trauma to the head. The pathologist opined that Keaton's head had been moving while the injury, which had required repeated blows, was inflicted. Michelle Boggs and Chastity Wodzinski, as well as Chastity's husband, Peter P.J. Wodzinski, were arrested shortly after Keaton's death and indicted in September of 2020 on a single count each of death of a child by parent, guardian, custodian, or other person by child abuse. In West Virginia, a conviction on this charge can result in a sentence of up to life in prison. Since the death of Keaton's father, U.S. Army veteran Christopher Boggs in Pennsylvania in 2019, Michelle Boggs was the little boy's legal guardian, the person with physical custody of a child, and Chastity and PJ were his legal custodians, who were legally responsible for his finances. It's not common for different people to be appointed as a child's guardian and custodian, but that was the case here, possibly because of Michelle's shady financial history. One family member said Michelle once prepared their taxes for them, stole their financial information, and used it to make herself a signer on their bank account. Another said Michelle transferred $10,000 from their 401k to herself, and when she was caught, they said, she claimed she had a brain tumor and didn't know what she was doing. Although Michelle brought Keaton to West Virginia in July of 2019 and was his legal guardian, he did not live with her until three months later. Initially, he lived with his Aunt Chastity and Uncle PJ and their children in a trailer in Lumberport. In the fall of the same year, the family moved to a rickety old house in Lost Creek, and Michelle moved into the house with them. Keaton's mother, Jessica Bishop Holt, did not have custody of Keaton at the time of Chris's death because she was battling a drug addiction. Although she tried to see Keaton, Chris's family managed to thwart her attempts to visit her son and used her legal situation as leverage. After Chris died, the boggs Wodzinski family all but vanished without a forwarding address, leaving Jessica unable to locate or even check up on her son. According to two people close to the family, calls were made to the West Virginia Department of Health and Human Services, or WVDHHS, in particular the Bureau for Children and Families, with concerns about Keaton's well-being, but intervention was not accomplished in time to save Keaton's life. West Virginia State Police have reportedly obtained images and text messages, some of which were deleted, from the cell phones belonging to Michelle and Chastity. WV News reported that PJ's phone could not be accessed because it was protected by a password and not compatible with investigator software. Harrison County Assistant Prosecutor Gina Snuffer said the only plea deal the state had offered the three defendants was for each of them to plead guilty and throw themselves on the mercy of the court, but all three declined, not wishing to roll the dice on a life sentence. At a pretrial hearing on February 12th of this year, Harrison Circuit Judge James A. Maddish granted severance requests for all three defendants meaning each of the three accused would have a separate trial from the others. Testimony was heard at that virtual hearing from a behavioral health professional who told the court that Michelle and Chastity were no-shows at an appointment scheduled for Keaton on March 17th, the day before he was rushed to the hospital with catastrophic bleeding on the brain. The two attended an intake appointment on February 5, 2020 to have Keaton treated by learning coping skills. However, they missed appointments with the provider for Keaton on February 19th and March 4th. A pediatrics office manager also testified about missed appointments, and a note was entered into evidence from the pediatrician regarding the doctor's examination of Keaton on January 29, 2020. 
During his testimony at the hearing, West Virginia State Police Sergeant Ronnie Gaskins spoke of seeing Keaton upon his admission to J.W. Ruby, taking photographs of his injuries, and taking the defendant's cell phones into evidence. According to Assistant Prosecutor Snuffer, the data extracted from the cell phones would be presented in court as evidence that Keaton had suffered abuse over an extended period of time. When Judge Maddish asked how the text messages and photos would show that Keaton's injuries were caused by the defendants and not self-inflicted by Keaton as they had claimed, Snuffer said the information could be used by the jury to decide, adding that Keaton could not tell them what happened because this little boy is dead. She said the photos would show the escalation of the abuse against Keaton, and the data would also show that Keaton's caretakers missed appointments for him and sometimes attempted to hide his injuries with makeup. Among Keaton's grievous injuries was a four-centimeter laceration on his penile shaft. Naturally, the defense attorneys for the accused were against the admission of the cell phone data at trial. PJ's attorney, Jason Glass, said the photos were highly prejudicial and that one in particular made him sick to his stomach. Harrison Deputy Defender Perry Jones, who represented Chastity at the time, and attorney Drema Cannon, Michelle's attorney, both agreed the photos were inflammatory. Judge Maddish took the evidence and arguments presented at the hearing under advisement, saying he would issue an opinion prior to trial. The trials were scheduled to begin on March 1st, March 29th, and April 19th, 2021. I fully expected them to be postponed indefinitely due to COVID-19, so I was surprised when P.J. Wodzinski's trial actually began on March 1st as scheduled. Since I couldn't watch the trial unfold live, I relied on printed news coverage of the proceedings to put this update together. I'll walk you through the trial day by day, starting with Monday, March 1st. During the prosecution's opening statement, the state laid out its case by saying it would prove intent via text messages discussing hiding Keaton's injuries and skipping doctor appointments. Although PJ claimed Keaton's injuries were self-inflicted, they pointed out that this poor, sweet baby had a laceration from the tip of his penis to his scrotum. They also mentioned that Keaton missed four out of five scheduled doctor appointments. In its opening statement, the defense, led by Jason Glass, said that PJ was innocent and reminded the jury that the prosecution must prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt. With three adults in the home, they claimed, it would be impossible to prove that PJ was responsible for Keaton's death. The first witness on the stand was Dr. Stuart Godwin of UHC, United Hospital Center, who told the court that Keaton was brought to the hospital unresponsive, at which time he was placed on a ventilator and taken for a CT scan. Dr. Godwin detailed Keaton's various injuries, and he also testified that there was no way Keaton could have self-inflicted the injury to his genitals. When he spoke with Michelle and Chastity in the emergency room, Dr. Godwin testified, they told him that Keaton was feeling unwell that morning and, after a nap, never woke up. The hospital, he said, contacted Child Protective Services as well as HealthNet because specialists rather than regular EMTs were required to transport Keaton to Ruby. Dr. Godwin testified on cross-examination by the defense that the CT scan also showed a blood clot in Keaton's lungs, and he said the injuries to Keaton's brain, based on the degree of swelling, appeared to have been caused several hours before. On redirect, the prosecution asked if Dr. Godwin's opinion was that Keaton's injuries were caused by child abuse, and he replied that it was, adding that Keaton's was the worst case of child abuse he had ever seen. Tuesday, March 2nd. The first witness on the stand was the digital forensic analyst from the West Virginia State Police who had extracted the data from the three defendants' cell phones, as well as three tablets. On the stand, she read aloud dozens of text threads between PJ and Chastity, many of which discussed hiding their nephew's injuries. One message from Chastity to PJ read, I'm going to put makeup on it to hide it. Next on the stand was Dr. Casey McCluskey of the WCU Medicine Children's Hospital Pediatric Intensive Care Unit, who said that when Keaton arrived at Ruby, his brain injury was too severe to be helped by surgical intervention, so she and her staff focused instead on what they could do, which was to stabilize him. She, too, told the court that Keaton's was one of the worst cases of child abuse she had ever encountered, describing the bruises all over his body and face, his two black eyes, and the laceration to his genitals, in addition to his low heart rate and low blood pressure. During Dr. McCluskey's testimony, the jury was shown photos of Keaton that a nurse took after his vital signs had been stabilized and he had been intubated, at which point the doctor testified she gathered Michelle and Chastity into a conference room to obtain Keaton's health history and ask them about his current state. Michelle asked if CPS was going to take her grandson, and the doctor said yes. Chastity explained to the doctor that Keaton woke up that morning with a headache bad enough that he did not eat breakfast or go outside to play with his cousins, opting instead to take a nap. 
Michelle told the doctor that when she attempted to rouse Keaton later on, he was unresponsive, so they brought him to UHC. Regarding Keaton's injuries, Dr. McCluskey said, the women told her that Keaton had several behavioral disorders, bruised easily, and self-harmed by hitting himself with a toy hammer. They claimed that Keaton's black eyes were caused when he repeatedly walked into doorknobs while sleepwalking. They also explained that bruises on Keaton's back had been caused when he tripped over the family dog and fell down the stairs. If you're familiar with Keaton's case, you may remember that the exact same excuse was used to explain the bruises evident in photos taken at Keaton's birthday party just weeks before his death. The far-fetched story the doctor heard when she asked about the cut on Keaton's genitals is beyond unbelievable. Michelle told the doctor that Keaton had a habit of digging his finger into his own penis and that she told him if he didn't stop, she would cut it off. Later, Michelle claimed she noticed her grandson had taken a knife to himself, causing the four-centimeter laceration. The doctor stated unequivocally on the stand that Keaton's injuries were not self-inflicted, but instead caused by someone else inflicting non-accidental trauma on him. Children his age, she testified, do not cut themselves, especially in very sensitive areas like the genitals. According to Dr. McCluskey, Keaton's vital signs took a drastic turn overnight due to the severe swelling of his brain, which she and another doctor believed was causing his brain to be crushed against his skull, causing brain death. Ruby policy requires two separate doctors to test for brain death at least 12 hours apart. The two tests took place on March 19th and March 20th, at which point Keaton was declared brain dead. Keaton's organs were donated to save other children, the doctor stated, and when the little guy was wheeled to the operating room, hospital staff lined the hallway to honor him. During her closing argument on Wednesday, March 3rd, Assistant Prosecutor Gina Snuffer described the myriad injuries Keaton suffered, adding, These are the most wicked and depraved acts one can commit. The defense did not present any witnesses, and clearly the evidence, including text messages containing quite a bit of harsh language from PJ, spoke for itself. I love this quote from WV News. Assistant Prosecutor Gina Snuffer and Prosecutor Rachel Romano gave a master class on knowing the strength of their case and then not overplaying it. Instead, they opted for a precise and, in the context of a homicide trial, rapid presentation that revolved around photos showing the brutal abuse suffered by Keaton. They then wrapped up with a photo from what appeared to be a happier time earlier in the boy's life. Jason Glass, during his closing argument, told the jury that the state had failed to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt, relying on circumstantial evidence and never proving who inflicted Keaton's fatal injury. The jury deliberated for a mere 25 minutes before returning with a guilty verdict, convicting Peter James Wodzinski Jr. of allowing either his wife or his mother-in-law to cause the death of his nephew via brutal blunt force blows to the head. The conviction could net PJ a sentence of life in prison with eligibility for parole as early as March of 2035, although parole was certainly not guaranteed and will depend on the opinion of the parole board at that time. He was not immediately sentenced. The trial of Keaton's grandmother, Michelle Boggs, took place in April of 2021. Michelle, who requires the use of an oxygen tank, was represented by veteran attorney Dreema Sincannon, who has practiced law for over 27 years. The state of West Virginia was represented by Harrison County Prosecutor Rachel Romano and Assistant Prosecutor Gina Snuffer. Michelle's trial began on Monday, April 19th, with jury selection and opening statements, after which an emergency room doctor testified to Keaton's condition when he arrived at the hospital. The doctor said Keaton was unconscious and covered in bruises, his breathing shallow, and his brain bleeding. The hospital notified Child Protective Services about Keaton's condition. Next, a retired West Virginia State Police trooper testified, during which the prosecution played for the jury two statements Michelle gave to the police regarding Keaton's injuries. There were important details that changed between the two accounts. At one point, Michelle stated to the trooper, I think PJ hurt Keaton. On Tuesday, April 20th, several more witnesses testified before Judge Maddish to the severity of Keaton's injuries, which again included two black eyes, a brain bleed, a severe four-centimeter cut on his genitals, a scar from a previous cut in the same place, which we hadn't previously heard about, a large scrape on the top of his right foot, and various contusions, abrasions, and lacerations all over his body. Dr. McCluskey of the Ruby Pediatric ICU again took the stand testifying about the story she was told while speaking with Michelle and Chastity on March 18, 2020, when Keaton first arrived. 
the story she was told differed yet again from the two stories Michelle told police. Even though she ultimately told at least five different stories, Michelle did not make it clear whether or not she was home during the hours preceding Keaton being taken to the hospital or even who found him unresponsive. At one point, Michelle said she found Keaton unresponsive and called Chastity to come home, but in another version, she told troopers that Chastity found Keaton unresponsive and carried him downstairs to her. Dr. McCluskey told the court Keaton was one of the worst, the sickest patients I've ever taken care of. The full picture of him was, beyond a doubt, not something he did to himself. Dr. McCluskey's testimony also produced a revelation that left tears in my eyes when I read it. After he died, Keaton received a cape, Dr. McCluskey said, because he became a superhero to us by donating his organs. A caseworker from Child Protective Services also took the stand, saying, There wasn't one part of his body that didn't contain an injury. It was obvious he was suffering abuse. The same CPS worker testified about the agency's decision to donate Keaton's organs, saying she and others had a discussion and we decided we wanted Keaton's short life to have a purpose. Through the gift of organ donation, she said, Keaton was able to give the gift of life to seven individuals. Registered nurse Meredith Linger, J.W. Ruby Memorial Hospital's sex assault nurse examiner coordinator, testified that she counted on Keaton's body at least 40 injuries in various stages of healing. This, at the time, was the worst case I had ever seen. On the same day, Ginger Herring, a West Virginia State Police digital forensic analyst from the Crimes Against Children unit, took the stand. During her testimony, jurors were shown multiple text messages sent to and from Michelle's phone, including a message from September 25, 2019, from Chastity to Michelle. Tell him to shut up. His Uncle PJ is sick and about to come beat his ass. And a message from September 7, 2019, from Michelle to a woman in Pennsylvania. Keaton has put a belt around his neck two times now and pulled it. A second message read, Yeah, because it is awful what is going through right now. He beats his face black and blue. There were multiple additional messages from Michelle to the woman in Pennsylvania that indicated Keaton regularly attended behavioral health counseling appointments, although the evidence presented by the prosecution shows that Keaton attended only a single appointment during the seven months his grandmother was his legal guardian. The court heard testimony from West Virginia Deputy Chief Medical Examiner Dr. Donald Pogeman, who testified that Keaton's death was a homicide, saying, Mr. Boggs died from blunt force injury to his head. Jurors were shown several photos of Keaton's injuries including one photo of the bruised, battered little boy with tubes and wires everywhere. The photos were taken by nurses under order from Dr. McCluskey, as well as Nurse Linger and the nurses working with her. Dr. McCluskey choked up during her testimony, saying the best way to describe Keaton's injuries objectively was by taking photographs of them. On Wednesday, the prosecution presented its final two witnesses. One was a behavioral counselor, who testified that she met with Keaton only once, and that three other appointments for him to meet with her had been canceled. The second was a pediatrician who examined Keaton on January 29, 2020, at which time Keaton had a black eye and scratches to his arms and face that were supposedly caused by the family dog. After the prosecution rested, the defense moved for a judgment of acquittal, saying the prosecution had not proved that Michelle knew about the abuse they claimed was caused by P.J. Wodzinski. Judge Maddish denied the motion. The defense called two witnesses, friends of Michelle, who both testified that Michelle had mentioned to them prior to Keaton's death that she was concerned about his self-injurious behaviors. Then, Michelle's attorney took a huge gamble by putting her client on the stand, a risky move many defense attorneys won't make, especially when their client's credibility is as dubious as Michelle's. Those five stories she told had to weigh heavily on the minds of jurors as they listened to her sob story. During the approximately two hours and 15 minutes of direct examination by her own attorney, Michelle testified that Keaton was a drug baby who injured himself for years and that she had never seen either PJ or Chastity hurt him. Michelle testified that she didn't spend a lot of time around Keaton until she brought him home from Pennsylvania, where he lived with his father, Christopher, until Chris's unexpected death on Father's Day in 2019. Although Michelle was his legal guardian, she said she left Keaton with Chastity and PJ, who have three children of their own while she stayed elsewhere, usually at a female friend's apartment. She brought Keaton back with her because, she said, she was depressed over her own son's death. Michelle told the court that Chastity was actually raising Keaton, but because Chastity had never gotten around to seeking legal guardian status, although she and PJ were Keaton's legal custodians and therefore in charge of his finances, Michelle became legal guardian despite not even living in the home. What is that nonsense? 
Claiming she did not know that Keaton was being abused, Michelle said she hadn't been feeling well and was hospitalized herself for a heart attack about two weeks before Keaton's death. After being released, she said, she stayed briefly with Chastity and PJ before going to her friend's apartment for eight or nine days. About two days before Keaton was hospitalized, she said, she returned to the Wodzinski home. Prior to cross-examination, prosecutor Rachel Romano argued that Michelle's own testimony opened the door for the prosecution to introduce into evidence several photos of Keaton that jurors had previously not been permitted to see or even know about. Michelle's attorney argued against the introduction of the photos, which I believe to be in large part the pictures of Keaton taken at his two birthday parties in early 2020, where he appears bruised and battered. The photos portray a little boy with clear bruising on his face and head, two swollen black eyes, and knots on his forehead. Romano was permitted to question Michelle about the photos, which were taken on January 3rd, February 13th, and March 7th, 2020, and she did so with the clear intention to undermine Michelle's defense that she had no idea Keaton was being abused. The prosecution even played part of Michelle's original police statement, in which she told police that Keaton had multiple bruises. Michelle stuck to her guns during cross-examination, insisting she didn't know Keaton's injuries were due to abuse. She said the injuries she had seen on Keaton weren't that bad or had other explanations. Michelle also said that Keaton always wore long-sleeved shirts, pants, and socks, saying he always claimed to be cold, and because of this, she never saw his injuries. She did see some injuries on his face, she said, but the explanations given by her daughter and PJ satisfied her. On the day Keaton was hospitalized, Michelle testified, his face was not bruised when she left the house that morning. She said PJ must have caused the injuries because he was the only adult home that day. Later, Keaton's face was the most injured she had ever seen it, but she was not aware of any additional injuries until seeing photos during her trial. After Michelle stepped down, the prosecution recalled the digital forensic analyst to authenticate the photos before court recessed for the day. Finally, attorney Sincannon once again moved for a judgment of acquittal, but Judge Maddish shot her down again. On the morning of Thursday, April 22, 2021, both sides presented their closing arguments. Gina Snuffer told the jury that all the photos they had seen of Keaton were screaming for a guilty verdict. Saying Michelle always had her phone with her, Snuffer pointed out, that's all she needed to save Keaton, one phone call. After both sides' closing arguments, the jury deliberated for just over half an hour before returning with a verdict, finding Michelle Lynn Boggs guilty. P.J. Wodzinski was sentenced in June to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 15 years, at the discretion of the parole board. In July, 50-year-old Michelle Lynn Boggs was sentenced by Judge Maddish to serve the same sentence as her son-in-law, 15 years to life. Prior to receiving her sentence, Michelle reportedly sobbed aloud through the brief statement she read to the court, saying, I live with this nightmare every day, and I will for the rest of my life. I loved Keaton, and I'm sorry, that's all. Both Michelle and PJ will be eligible for parole in 2035, when Michelle is 63 and PJ is 47. Michelle is now serving her sentence at Lakin Correctional Center in West Columbia, West Virginia. PJ, who is now 34, is incarcerated in Huntonsville Correctional Center, where he now sports a less-than-charming neck tattoo if his prison photo is any indication. Chastity's trial is scheduled to begin in March of 2022. I expect to release one more update episode before the end of the year, which I hope will bring us all up to date on all of the ongoing cases I've followed since beginning the podcast in February of 2020. As of late, you may have noticed I've been trying to cover fewer ongoing cases, and the reason for that is to keep the number of cases I have to follow manageable. My sources for this update episode were the Ashtabula Star Beacon, the Green Day Press Gazette, WV News, 12WBOY, and WDTV. That's it for this week. Join me next week for another episode. If you like the show, please follow or subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Spreaker, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. And please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. Visit the website at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod.com where you can listen to episodes or become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to bonus content and exclusive gifts. Follow the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, 
and Pinterest at Suffer the Little Children Pod, and on Twitter and TikTok at STLC Pod. View photos related to today's episode on Facebook and Instagram. For more stories like the one you heard today, visit SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com. This podcast is researched, written, hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. All music for the show is licensed from AudioJungle.net. Email tips, comments, questions, or case suggestions to SufferTheLittleChildren.pod at gmail.com. For more information about preventing or reporting child abuse, visit ChildHelp.org or call your area's child abuse hotline. If you see something, say something. Until next week, bye everyone.